Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm looking at Herodotus's The Histories. This is part of our section on ancient history and then what I'm trying to do with this is look at the importance and the background of this hugely significant source uh, for our study on Greek ancient history. To start off with I'm going to have a little bit of a look at the life of Herodotus. So he was born around 484 BC. This is again a rough date. There's been some calculations worked out based on how old they think he is later on and then they've worked it backwards. So it's not exact but it's around there. He was uh, born in a place called Heliconassus uh, which is was in southwest Asia Minor so it, it will be I think modern day Turkey. It, it was a Greek city um, but it, it there was close contact uh, with various Persian subject groups that lived in, around in Asia Minor as well such as uh, the Carians. Um, so it, it was quite a cosmopolitan place, and 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 through this, um, Herodotus would have met a, a kind of a good mixture of people. He, he was um, upper class. He was well educated. He was he was well connected. But one of the things we believe about him is that he was opponent of uh, the Ligdamis. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. He was a, a tyrant of Heliconassus, who who then we believe forced Herodotus into exile. Herodotus then, we believe, came back and helped overthrow uh, Ligdamus uh, and, and remove him as tyrant. Uh, possibly during his exile, we, we know Herodotus travelled um, extensively uh, to Egypt, Tyre, uh, uh, Babylon, Cynthia, uh, Greece, and, and a whole kind of other range of areas in, in, in what we think of as the kind of the Greek and Persian uh, world of this time. He, he lived in Athens for a time, um, possibly on two occasions, probably one earlier than he, he leaves. And, and he just he possibly does or doesn't come back to Athens later on. Um, the Athenians are said to have been enthu very enthusiastic in their reception of Herodotus and, and of him and his work. They believed that he, he he delivered some of his work, he kind of recited it or read it, in, more likely recited it given the time, um, to audiences in Athens. And he he was granted um, money from public funds as, as, and a significant amount of money, so it would be, have been considered uh, quite a fortune at the time. Uh, this may in some way explain his positive treatment of the Athenians in, in a lot of the accounts in his histories. Uh, the Thebans and the Corinthians uh, supposedly would not offer patronage for his work, and, and notably they are um, uh, treated far less sympathetically in his works than the Athenians are, and he, he does tend to to have quite a pro-Athenian voice. Now, whilst in Athens, Herodotus was said to have been friends with the playwright um, Sophocles, uh, and it was claimed that he was uh, friendly with the Alchemenids. Uh, Alchemenids. Um, again, I have huge um, apologies for my pronunciation on that one. I'm, I'm really bad with some of these Greek names. Uh, this was the, the kind of Pericles, so the really significant family group in um, in Athens. Um, but historians now starting to question that. Um, he he may have well well have been positive towards them, but that doesn't necessarily mean there was that that personal bond or friendship. Uh, he he did, however, again, as, as I've already said, have, clearly have a pro-Athenian viewpoint. It's believed that he he left Athens somewhere around 444-443, and and was one of the the group who set up and founded um, uh, Thury in southern Italy, which was a a, a pan-Hellenic um, state, meaning it was uh, made up of Greeks from all different states. So it wasn't just people from Athens; it was people um, from various other policies uh, across Greece that set up this uh, this new city-state in southern Italy. He died somewhere around 420 BC, um, and the most kind of significant context in in his work was was the tension and fighting between Sparta and Athens. So he goes back much earlier and, and talks about events are developing much earlier in history, and then, but but when he's writing, that's the key thing that's going on, and, and so. Maybe again, this this leans in some of his writing where you are likely, therefore, to give an account that is either going to be more in line uh, with a Spartan viewpoint or more in line with an Athenian one. Um, Herodotus introduces his work by saying he, his narrative was a, a result of his 
history, his research, his inquiry, uh, and thus providing the name for the, what is, is quite clearly the most important subject ever, which is history. Um, our knowledge of his life uh, largely comes from what is known as the Suda, which was written about 900 AD in the Byzantine Empire. It's not fully clear how Herodotus believed his works would be published. He tended to, to in his time, he would have recited them to audiences, which is kind of the, the tradition going back to the likes of Homer. Um, nor is it 100% clear who his intended audience was. So it, it appears to have been Panhellenic. So it doesn't appear that it was it was solely written to be to be um, to listen to or or, or 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 taken in by those in Athens, but those uh, across Greece. And, and again, that would that would kind of fit with um, he, him going and settling through uh, with this idea of his pan his Panhellenic. Um, the Panhellenic state and, and the, the fact that he traveled so widely. So he was probably trying to to get as broad an audience as he could if he if he could possibly have that kind of full concept of it, because obviously the way things were mainly delivered was was was, was through um, public recital. Now, the work of Herodotus is, is is divided into nine books. Now, obviously, we don't think it was divided into nine books by Herodotus in, in, in that way. Uh, and it covers a, a range of topics, including kind of what we consider to be folk folk stories or folklore. It, there's bits of zoology in there, some of which is a bit crazy because it's stuff that he reports but hasn't seen. Um, ants the size of dogs, things like that. Um, there's some geography in it. Um, there, there's some anthropology in it. So, so he looks at the kind of the histories and, and, and ethnic origins of peoples. There's, there's lots of kind of really interesting stuff in it. It's a really kind of broad broad piece of work it's not it's not maybe a history as we would look at it today um it's not just a, a narrative account of events it kind of goes off in different directions and starts telling you different things at different points it is certainly as the, the latin would expect an inquiry or investigation which comes from that latin historia uh, and it is very much the first work of its kind and therefore in its very essence, it's got this huge kind of extra level of significance and importance to it because this is the first history writing, which obviously makes it even more exciting. Um, there are a whole um, series of books. Book one uh, it talks about the fall of Lydia and the rise of the Persians uh, under Cyrus. Um, we, we've got book two, look, looks at the story of Persia, uh, continues the per story of Persia and describes the geography and history of Egypt. Book three, amongst other things, describes the conquest of Egypt by Persia, uh, the rise of Samos, um, Darius taking the Persian throne uh, and his successes against Samos and Babylon. Um, book four looks at the Scythians and describes Darius's campaign against them and, and others. And then the bit which for, for what we're looking at in my class is, is hugely significant is, is kind of book five onwards because uh, we're going to look at, at the um, the Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian Wars and with, with the kind of uh, the, this period of, um, a, 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 of Greek history. And so we've got book five and six at the scene for the Persian Wars, including the Ionian revolts and the Battle of Marathon in 490. Book six gives a, a history of Athens in the late sixth century. Uh, books seven to nine cover the Persian Wars themselves. And, and on that aspect of the course, Herodotus is, is, is our key source. Now, what are his sources, however? Because obviously what we're doing is we're reading his account. So where does his account come from? Well, some of it comes from his own personal observations. He's a, he's a well-traveled, uh, well-educated man. He also made use of uh, mainly oral reports. People he interviewed, such as members of the rich and powerful families of the Athenians and Sparta, uh, Persian nobility, many fought in the various battles that he talks about, uh, Egyptian priests, as well as literary sources, and also uh, some epigraphical evidence of kind of archaeology and inscriptions uh, type stuff. Um, the main part where his evidence seems to come from is oral accounts, and so obviously there's, it's difficult to then kind of track back through his sources, or so he's got his sources, but we haven't got obviously recordings of the original oral accounts because such things couldn't possibly exist. Um, some of them lead to some problems. So, for example, um, uh, we, we've got the oral accounts that he takes from a priest in Egypt who explains to him the background of the mon monuments and things that he visited. And, and 
not all of it is actually accurate. Um, we've got the, the accounts of wealthy Athenians and Spartans are central to much of his work. And this explains some of the times where he goes off on tangents and gives you kind of sidebars where he, he'll, he'll, you'll be in the middle of some really important event or some really important battle. And then you get a, a, a kind of quite a lengthy description of who somebody is and their family origins and things like that. Um, so this tends to be something that he diverges into a lot, and that might well be because a lot of what he's coming from is being from talking to a member of that that family who then told him all about the history of their family more than than the history of the event, if that makes sense. Um, Herodotus, we believe Herodotus listened to accounts from Persian nobles, which gained him some insight into the Persian court, although that there is often criticism of his work of being fairly limited in, in this point of view, and he tends to kind of project kind of Greek ways of doing things into the Persian court, which wouldn't not necessarily fully understood how the Persian court worked. Um, Herodotus also used the works of poets and, and, and writers such as Homer, amongst many others, in his work as, as kind of the basis of some of the stuff that he was writing. He used, as I've mentioned, uh, evidence from inscriptions, such as those on the tombs of the Scythian kings, the tombs of the Greek dead uh, uh, Plataea, uh, the, the epitaphs of the Spartans at Thermopylae. So the inscriptions and the archaeological evidence are there behind, and some of that uh, it, it continues to exist, and some of the stuff that has been seen since, and some of it is no longer there. Um, so is he objective? Is he giving us a kind of a clear and accurate picture uh, of the events that took place? Well, it appears, first of all, he, he doesn't simply accept all he's told at face value and, and, and will often tell the audience that he is, he is repeating an account or a story that he's been told and that he did, and they give the impression that he doesn't necessarily take it to be true but he simply recounts it kind of going this is what I found out about this um, and he will often on, on occasions leave um, the, the audience to make its own mind up particularly where there are contrasting accounts um, sometimes he, he will show a preference from one version rather than the other but often he will say this is something I have been told um, and, and kind of leave it like that and leave the audience to make its decision his account is pro pro Athenian, for example, and on the Persian Wars, he, he could be this could this could be down to the fact that he, he's relying on Athenian sources. Um, he, he appears to either not recognise the partisanship of some of the sources he's using from Athens, or he uses or chooses to take Athenian accounts above others. So. It's, it's whether the pro-Athenian bias in it is, is a deliberate act or whether it's because actually a load of the evidence that he's gathered, that he's looked at and then has used, he's, he's taken it from Athens and therefore he kind of transfers that pro-Athenian view through his work rather than necessarily having that view. I mean, my inclination is that that, that he, he, he is pro-Athenian and that comes across in his work. Another interesting thing for a modern reader in particular is it, it, in the gods and the supernatural. He, he kind of appears strange in some of his accounts um, to a modern audience because uh, he gives so much kind of credence, so much importance uh, to the interventions of gods in the events he describes. Uh, he viewed gods playing a, a really important part in shaping events. That, and, and this would have been very typical of this this time. Uh, and Although it can seem odd to a modern reader, it's not some reason. It's not a reason to completely dismiss the reliability of his work. And you look at it and go, "Well, yes, this is explained because um, people believe that the gods talked to men in their sleep, or there were omens in the sky, or the the what the oracles, particularly the, the oracles of places like Delphi, would told people they were hugely significant." So yes, that would have been a commonly held belief at the time, and it is one that seems to be held by Herodotus. But there is plenty of other stuff in there in what, what he's telling us. So although he may gloss over what we might consider to be genuine causes of stuff, there, there, there is elements of that in there. And there's still a very good account of, of events that took place. I mean, he, he does give credit to, for example, the defence of Apollo's temple at Delphi against Persian attack to the gods. And, then, and maybe that's not 
how we would tell it in our history of it. But the, the, this also then tells us quite a lot about the belief of the Greeks, pe Greek people, which is, again, a really important part of what we're taking out of this. He does tend to, at times, take supernatural explanations over and above the more worldly ones. So there was plenty of political and military reasons why Xerxes decided to invade Greece. However, Herodotus, Herodotus prefers to stress the importance of um, a dream sent by the gods as the reason why he finally makes the decision. So th th there's lots of interesting stuff in there that not only tells us about the events, but tells us about how Greek people of this time saw the world around them and how they explained events that were going on around them. When it comes to politics, Herodotus tends to focus on individuals and their personal motivation, as well as going into their family history and trying to find reasons why they would behave through all of this, rather than looking at the, the kind of the wider context or co and causation of political events. He, he's seemingly more interested in the inner workings of the minds of great men rather than kind of structural or pragmatic reasons behind uh, uh, political actions. And he does, as I've mentioned already, tend to see things through, other through a, rather through a, an Athenian lens, and therefore things that, in terms of the way that he looks at political systems and things like that, seems to be more as an Athenian might say it rather than a Spartan, for example. So I hope that's been uh, useful for you. I, I intend to make a, a, a more, more and more videos on on this part of ancient history in terms of the story of, of the, the Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian Wars in this period of Greek history, and also um, more videos like this looking at some of our uh, more, more important and significant co um, sources. Uh, again, aiming to help my students and anybody else who's watching these in their, their study of ancient history. So thank you uh, very much for watching. If you have liked, please hit like. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, uh, please leave them below. And if you haven't subscribed to Alan History Note and you're interested in bits of ancient history as well as, as bits of modern history and early modern history and even modern politics, then do subscribe. There's lots and lots of different things on this channel, a whole range of subjects covered across history and politics. Thank you very much for watching.